Hello. Welcome to another in the series on Benedictine values, the hallmarks of Benedictine life. The Gospel and the rule of St. Benedict are the foundation stones of the monastery here at St. Benedict's and at St. John's Abbey. The life of Jesus and the life of Benedict provide the guiding principles and values that inspired our two communities to establish the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. What this means is that these schools, like the monastic communities from which they came, strive to use and to develop all that is best in the human person, with Christ as our source and goal. This series of Benedictine hallmarks or values is intended to help deepen your understanding of these values in practical terms. What difference can they make in your life as a student, staff, or faculty member? Rabbi Hanuk of the Hasidic, uh, the Hasidic Jewish tradition tells this story. There was once a man who was very stupid. When he got up in the morning, it was so hard for him to find his clothes that at night he almost hesitated to go to bed for thinking of the trouble he would have on waking. One evening, he made a great effort, took paper and pencil in hand, and as he undressed, noted down exactly where he had put everything he had on. The next morning, very well pleased with himself, he took the slip of paper in hand and read, cap, and there it was. He set it on his head, pants, and there they were. He got into them, and so it went until he was fully dressed. That's all very well, but now where am I myself? He asked in great consternation. Where in the world am I? The rabbi, having told that story, added that the man was not so stupid after all, because he knew which question was the most important. He had a problem with forgetfulness, but he was perfectly aware that the hat, pants, and other clothes he put on did not go to the heart of his whereabouts and his identity in this world, but only touched them exteriorly. There remained the fundamental question, where in the world am I? Today's topic is stability, and I'd like us to think for a moment about the word stability. So let's just brainstorm quietly and think of what words come into your mind when I say stability. And perhaps there's an image or two that also comes as you think of stability. Now, you may have thought of words like lasting, immobile, immovable, rather, steady, firm. And maybe an image that you came to was a rock, the foundation of a building, a home, a friendship. Now, think of the opposite. What words or images come to mind when I say instability? Did you think of changing, or unreliable, unbalanced, uncertain, impermanent? Maybe your image was something like a river, a sailboat, a wind in the trees, or maybe the stock market. In Benedict's vision, stability is an indispensable means for both asking and answering the question of where I am. I may know where I work, I may know where my next class is, but if I don't wake up beyond these, there isn't much hope that I will see clearly where I am, the source and foundation of my life. 
So I'd like to set this conversation on stability, monastic stability, in the context of the world as we've seen it in recent years. We've recently come out, hopefully we've come out, of a year of unsettling, constantly changing and often tragic results from the coronavirus. We're reeling still from deep political divisions and the stark evidence of racism in our nation. We know well the grim statistics about the profound changes in our climate that threaten human health and life, both plants and animals, all that are on many that are on the verge of extinction. We're changing jobs, some estimates say at least 12 jobs, switching careers and often the geographical moves that those entail. Two or three marriages and mixed families are increasingly common. And despite the wonders and benefits of technology, high-speed internet and all the rest, many of us feel like we're in a world that is moving so fast that everything becomes like the blur you experience on a tilt of whirl. As you spin faster and faster, all you see around you are flashes of color and indistinct shapes. Nothing is clear. Benedict saw that Christ in God is the center and still point of our lives. His ideas about stability are intended to help us see the face of God to know God more and more clearly in and through all our relationships. The psalmists tell us God is lasting love. God's love endures forever. God is our rock, our stronghold, our safety. Stability is a way to see that this is where we are, always in and around God. In the first chapter of his rule, St. Benedict says who he is writing the rule for. And he does this by observing that there are different kinds of monks, and the one of which he identifies are called the Cerebeites. And these are the ones he says, the ones he says, whose law is what they like to do, whatever strikes their fancy. They follow their own way. And then there are those he calls gyrovags who spend their entire lives drifting, roaming, wandering, and rootless. And then he proceeds, let us draw up a plan for the strong kind, the Cenobite. That is the one who belongs to a monastery and who follows the leader, prioress or abbot, and live under this rule. This rule is written for those who form a community these are the Cenobites, the community that Benedict writes for. We make a vow, a promise of stability, to live a life in this community. It's a lifelong promise to stay put long enough to hear, to see, to change, and to allow ourselves to be changed by what we see and what we hear in the ordinary days of our life together. Everything in the rule is about relationship, stable and ongoing connections with one another, even the way we eat and how we pray together, how we work, how we relate in the way that we handle things and care for them, how we care for the sick, the old and the young, and how we welcome pilgrims who are in search of a home. To realize these connections, these relationships, we have to learn to listen. That word you hear so often when people talk about the rule, the word that we so often quote and say, this is what it means. And in part, we know that to listen means to pay attention, to focus on something or someone beyond ourselves. We all know this. If someone is looking at her phone when you're talking to her, you know she's not really there. She can't understand because she's not listening. 
And if my mind is on my work when I'm holding my child, I may miss that first smile that deepens our bond. So what does the promise of stability, monastic stability, have to do with the world? What might it mean for you? Stability is about people being rooted in a place. It's about belonging. It's about shared memories and shared loves. And it's about the commitment to abide in God, the God who abides in us. We are a part of the world on the move. Millions and millions of displaced people are wandering. They have lost what they once knew as home and country. They're aching and longing to find safety and food, to find a home. The numbers of immigrants and refugees in our own country increase every day. They literally don't know where in the world they are. We have a responsibility and the opportunity that Pope Francis reminds us of that showing care and concern for the most vulnerable of our earth will give us the voice and compel us to use our voices to cry for the voiceless and to find for them a place. As Benedict says, we stay in a place long enough to know the land, not only the land of our monasteries, but the landscape of the world in which we live. We witness to our belief that God is still and always at work in our communities and in the community of the world, no matter how dark or dull it feels at times. A laywoman and theologian, Esther Duvall, puts it this way, if I want to think about my own stability, I must ask myself where I am rooted. Where are my escape routes that keep me moving so I don't have to really see or hear, or who or what I may not want to see or hear. The value and demand of hospitality, another cherished landmark of Benedictines, means that we find ways to share the blessing of stability with others. There is a story from a book by Frederick Bachman entitled The Man from A Man Called Ove. Loving someone, he writes, is like moving into a house. At first you fall in love with all the new things, amazed that every morning all this belongs to you, as if fearing that someone would suddenly come rushing in through the door to explain that a terrible mistake had taken place. You weren't actually supposed to live in this wonderful place. And then, over the years, the walls become weathered, the wood splinters here and there, and you start to love that house, not so much because of its perfection, but rather for its imperfections. You get to know all the nooks and crannies, how to avoid getting the key caught in the lock when it's cold outside, which of the floorboards flex slightly when one steps on them, or exactly how to open the cupboard doors without them creaking. These are the little secrets that make it your home. When I first entered Benedictine life, and when you first came to St. Ben's or St. John's, it was like a new house, filled with beautiful buildings, a group of beautiful, interesting, and unique individuals. I've seen this happen over all the years I've been at St. Ben's, both in the women in my community and in the thousands of students over time who have come to know it as a home. It's the same in the relationships that are formed both in school and in the years after. At first it was like living in a house together, and then as we lived and stayed put, we learned some of the little secrets of divine life and love. It was then that we knew the difference between a house that is filled with individuals and a home that is filled with a community of friends. Each year, Bennies and Johnnies know and celebrate homecoming. You know what happens when your roots of friendship grow deep and all their enduring loves and affect and the, the enduring love, how it affects your life. You know what it means to feel at home with one another 
and in a place. Like the man in the opening story, we have problems with forgetfulness. But if we are steadfast in our desire to make not houses, but homes, both here and among the crowds of the lost, our brothers and sisters throughout the world, we can find ways to share the blessing of stability that is the foundation of any home. In the end, maybe our challenge is not to say, how can we make a home for the world? But rather, how can the world find a home in us?